Um, please, can I invite the other uh, presenters of the abstracts up, up to the stage so we have an option for discussion and come will join us as the other two speakers, please. Um, Dr. Rondon and Bernard Cano and Ger Jerome Kuhlman uh, will not be able to join. So please have a seat. Hi, nice to meet you. That was amazing data. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, I think we are all. One, two, there's one. One more is please. Ich brauche keinen. Ich kann nicht jetzt stehen. Ich kann nicht stehen da. So, let's start with the abstracts um, that were pre presented so nicely. So, um, are there any questions for the abstracts, maybe from the speakers? Maybe I start with the um, abstract uh, on the ocular ultrasound, um, which was very interesting, a new method to assess calcification. So um, we as nephrologists are not used to do that. So can you shortly maybe give us an insight? How did you decide where to look at? Because, of course, the ball, you have so many options uh, for counting calcifications. Did you? decide on a certain um, area? Well, actually, we asked for the ophthalmologist to tell us which could be a good place to look for. And they told us that maybe the retinal area, because it's a highly vascularized as well as the choroids. So we're focused on those areas in the choroids and retinal area. But then we uh, just learned that there are other places that usually are not vascularized and, and the calcium deposits are there because we can detect it by, by that images. So at the end, we count uh, as a positive calcification if there is a calcification any place where the calcification is. And uh, also we count them. And most of the times are in the retinal, in the choroids area. But we found in other areas, in the vitreous, we found in the lens, we found even in conjunctival area. OK, so, so any classification, it is screen the whole eyeball. Yeah, yeah, we screen the, the, okay. the whole okay. eyeball, okay. the total eyeball. What about cataract? Uh, we found uh, some cataracts. And uh, those five patients that we does not include is because they have some troubles in the lens, and sometimes it couldn't be possible to perform the ultrasound. OK, OK. Mm -hmm. Any other questions to this? So I think this is a nice uh, method to maybe look uh, at, at larger populations and uh, to correlate with mortality and other classification scores. Um, very nice. Um, so let's, are there any, any other questions? What about uh, the, let me move to Dr. Bahena. Um, you studied the phosphorus variability. Um, and you showed that those with the highest variability um, had the highest risk. Um, so variability can be from the mean value up and down. OK, but uh, is there a kind of indication that um, the risk was also associated with excess phosphate, depending on low phosphate? Uh, yes, we try to um, define the variability is complicated, because each author gives its own definition. So we try with the model with uh, absolute change. Uh, that's mean that we have uh, maybe in in January a phosphorus of five, and in February we have a phosphorus maybe of nine. Uh, so we have the variability of four. Uh, all these uh, variabilities on average. Uh, so I'm not sure in this moment if that's the the ideal method that we that we can get mm. better results. Was but it associated with any other indications of? Um, dialysis quality or maybe or dialysis duration, adherence, compliance, um, weight gain, inter, interdilytic weight gain. So you know there are so many factors yeah. interacting with uh, phosphate levels. Yeah. 
uh, we need to improve with that um, with that results. Um, a multivariate model, maybe, but I think that another point, that important point, is that whatever we can do for the control of phosphorus, if the phosphorus remained, uh, maybe one month is up and the, another month maybe is down, uh, it's a problem. So I think that we need to improve that. Okay, here's also one question. How do you explain that phosphate variability is associated with outcomes? Um, and, and now, it's only just a theory, but I think that the, the calcification is worse, maybe. But we need to, to continue studying that, that variability. Okay, um, let me move to the urea abstract. Um, uh, no, not abstract, <laughs> the urea talk. So um, there are some questions on, uh, on urea here. Um, is intravenous urea still available, and if so, should it be used? Uh, no, it's not available anymore. Um, I think it was known as Eurobert and Uriafil, but these are discontinued by the FDA a long time ago. They used to use it for, to treat intracranial hypertension or even glaucoma, mm -hmm. but it's not available anymore. And there were some issues. It can cause hemolysis sometimes, so it was discontinued. It's only the oral that is available now. So are you prescribing the urea or, or has a patient to buy it himself? Well, because it's a f supplement. We, we have it in the hospital. So we actually prescribe urea in the hospital for the patients. Okay. Okay. And, um, and then when they get discharged, we try to help them get the urea. Because it's a supplement, not a drug, a lot of the insurances don't, might not pay for it. So I think we need more prospective data because eventually if we have more data, I think the FDA might approve it as a drug. So, Are there any long-term data on how long you can... There, there is long-term data. I mean, the, the group that has the most experience, I would say, is the, the group from Belgium, Guy de Col. They, they use urea for more than 30, 40 years and they have absolutely no issues with that. They, and, they use it very successfully. And, and for single patients, for how long are patients treated with urea if they... Right. In the study that I show, uh, comparing baptons versus urea, they, they were on urea for more than a year. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Um, another question relating to that, does oral urea change GFR? <laughs> <laughs> PCR so, probably. You know, <laughs> Kalanta would say yes. Yeah, I, actually I was wondering... The, if it does, uh, of course. Just going back to your original question, now th there, I'm aware of one company in the U.S. that has made urea available. So we can write prescription, right. patients pick them up. It has, uh, as you, as Studley mentioned, different flavors. However, going back to where uh, Dr. Martin Kohlmann comes from, Germany, when I was practicing uh, in, in Nuremberg, Germany in, in, but until 93, neurosurgeons used to give mannitol and urea, right? So I was wondering, do you know by any chance if uh, since uh, uh, he mentioned uh, it was used as osmotic, Diuretics, like, uh, is it still being practiced? Are, are you aware of that? No, it's it's not being practiced. Manitol is not uh, practiced anymore, and uh, urea is not practiced anymore. At, ne at least, not to my knowledge. Okay. All right, but so. going back now to your question about uh, whether or not it's going to confound the uh, uh, calculations, uh, probably yes, and and the reason is being that traditionally, also for SIADH. Some experts for decades have said high protein diet, mm -hmm. right? To generate urea, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, the answer is probably yes. yes uh, if you have urea in your blood, you have to uh, make sure that this is, uh, you, you have to calculate this. Now, mm -hmm. but, but uh, now with that, I was wondering what your suggestion, what your comments are about high protein diet for SIADH. <laughs> I mean, I, I try not to restrict patients with uh, protein. Certainly, I ask them to eat as much as they can. But I think the amount of, uh, I, I did a calculation once about the amount of urea, of, of, the, of protein that you need to eat to get the same amount of urea. I think my calculation was you have to eat three 16 ounce ribeye steaks a day to get to 60 grams of urea. So that's a lot of, I mean, of steak, of protein. So it's, you know, not, not sustainable for patients. But going back to the question about the GFR, uh, I'm not aware of any studies in humans, although I remember there was a study in sheep where they give uh, sheep who were exposed to a high-protein diet, urea, IV, 
it didn't change the GFR, but when they're exposed to a low protein diet and they give IV urea, the GFR increase. That's the only data that I know. Where there's something like hyperfiltration, uh, but that's more by uh, amino acids. The, the, and it's unclear. Well, so the, the uh, renal plasma flow did not change, but the filtration fraction increase. Yeah, but so, that's not yeah, a GFR, yeah. actually. That, so The mechanism, um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, it depends, you know, you, you, you could, if, if you consume a lot, a huge amount of creatine, for example, um, then you, and you calculate uh, creatinine clearance, uh, or, or then you measure creatinine, and it may increase, but if you measure creatinine clearance, it's the same, okay? So because just it's a you know, creatinine concentration, it's a result of synthesis and excretion. So um, I think it shouldn't affect the GFR. Um, there's... Uh, more question. Let me ask one question to the pediatrician. Um, the measuring KT over V in babies, um, how is the volume estimated in V? Since you, 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 you reported on KT over V in children, so you have K clearance and time divided by V. So which V are you using so in, 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 in uh, Babies and uh, very young children, V is not the 50% that it is in adults or 60%. So we don't calculate KT or V by putting KT and V. We use the log, uh, log regression formula that is available and we put pre-dialysis and post-dialysis BUN and calculate KT or V. Okay, that, in, that already, is this the, the Dogiras? Yes. Patient? So John is here, is that? Uh, validated for two-year-old children, what do you think? <laughs> I'm glad the expert is here, you know, this is really, we have to take that opportunity. I'm not an expert, but one of the papers we wrote that's widely ignored by the pediatricians uh, was that perhaps dialysis should be sized in small children by surface area. I mean, you know, your pediatricians, you, you prescribe most drugs in kids by surface area, not by... Uh, total body water. And if you look at the native GFR in children, it stays about 100 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, all the way down to about age two. And when we modeled uh, dialysis, it sort of goes against uh, some of your data, although it wasn't clear to me what the age range was. But you can give a KT or V 1.8 in a four-year-old and that same dose normalized to body surface area will be much lower than a KTV of 1.3 uh, or 2 even in an adult. So uh, if you're doing the Napertex analysis, I'd, I'd love to see uh, a parallel analysis by body surface area to see if there'd be any, any change. Yeah, that's a nice uh, suggestion. Maybe you should <laughs> start a collaboration. Or, or I, I have a couple of other things. Yes, please. Some of the so, in the phosphorus uh, variability study, I mean, it looks like you can look at almost any variable uh, in the world and you look at variability and you will find that variability of, of any lab parameter, blood pressure, whatever, is associated with poor outcome. I don't know what it is, but you, everything, you know, Peter has done a lot of this. And why that happens, I guess patients are just not very stable. And the most... Uh, likely explanation for variability in phosphorus is uh, eating food. So either you're eating a different quality of food, maybe one time you're eating a diet high in additives and another time not high in additives. And the other time, the other explanation is, well, you're just not eating as much protein or as much food. And it makes sense that a sick patient might be uh, more irregular in terms of the amount of food they eat than a healthy patient. So one way you could look at this is to calculate the protein catabolic rate in your patients and see if your changes in phosphorus are paralleled by changes in PCR. And then if they are, then that would help you at least uh, analyze the data. So I think that was another, I don't know, Cam, maybe you have some, 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 uh, some ideas on this. Some other questions, John? Comments? Yeah, I had one, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> um, um, oh, maybe. I think, oh, but the urea. I, I think it's. Uh, I think it's, it's almost be worthwhile to to test oral urea in patients on dialysis, 
with two potential applications. One could be uh, less disequilibrium syndrome, mm. because you know some of these people, especially older people, that are in the, in the U.S. They have very high efficiency dialysis for three or four hours, and they feel bad. And we know that most of the toxins they're removing, uremic toxins, are more important than urea per se. So even if you gave them a little bit of oral, I don't know if it would make them throw up if it's, if it's yucky to eat. But you could argue that um, perhaps giving somebody some oral urea at the outset of dialysis might smooth the treatment. But the other, the other possibility is it may protect the kidneys and renal flow and residual kidney function. Because we found that when uh, in the FHN trial, when you do this very extended dialysis, more than, more than 20 hours a week, uh, it killed residual kidney function. And it wasn't clear why. And maybe it's volume, but the blood pressure wasn't effective. But maybe some of that urea is, is renal protective. And so I think if, if this stuff is oral and it's relatively uh, safe, uh, these, these two areas of people are looking to do research, uh, these might be things that you could look at. If, well, I'm, I'm, if I can I'm, ask also some, uh, another question on yes. urea, because uh, the protective effect of urea is quite interesting. I, actually, uh, you showed one of the slides. And, and then on the other hand, they say that if there is a hyponatremic patient who ha also has CKD, for example, or, or advanced CKD, kidney failure. And if that patient needs dialysis, for example, if each of us right now want to dialyze a patient with sodium 125 and, and BUN of 80 or 100, uh, traditionally some nephrologists have said in the past, uh, especially in Europe, there was some, uh, one of my former mentors in Nuremberg used to say that don't worry, there is no way a uremic patient ever develop pontimyelinolysis, even if in two hours you increase sodium from 125 to 140, because you, at the same time, you lower urea from over 100 to down to 20. So I was wondering what comments you have on that one, if, if that's true that uremic patients or azotemic patients are protected against uh, pontimyelinolysis. A great question. Uh, there hasn't been studies in humans, but there is a few studies in animals where they make the animals azotemic, uh, and then they and the hyponatremic, and they overcorrect the sodium. And the animals, the higher the BUN, the less likely they'll develop osmotic demyelination. Okay. So there is data about that. And I mean, also I mentioned in my presentation that there is a very few reports of dialysis patients develop osmotic demyelination yeah. when, when you correct the sodium high. So there is a, a one hypothesis uh, that shows that when you correct the sodium uh, very fast, um, usually there is this um, um, uh, process that happens inside the cells called uh, re volume regulatory increase where the cells actually start uptaking osmolites, but it takes five to seven days for the cells to do that. Urea apparently increases the sp speed or the rate of uptake of these osmolites, protecting the, uh, the, uh, the cells against shrinking. So that's one of the mechanisms that has been postulated that urea perhaps is protective in these, in these animals and maybe in, in patients as well. Okay, very nice. Good question, good answer. Um, let me turn to Shelly Fang. Um, there are some questions, and quite interesting questions. Uh, two questions with quite similar content. So are there toxins that interfere most with protein folding? And second, is there a correlation between ure uremic toxin levels and muscle chaperone levels or activity? Sorry, I missed it up. Could okay. You so are there toxins, uremic toxins, yeah. that interfere most with the protein folding? So um, protein folding takes certain, um, we, per, each proteins need to, how do I say that, be folded in a certain range of pH value um, and certain range of electrolytes concentrations, also like, we are like our lab is more interested about like sodium, mm -hmm. and um, as Dr. McIntyre said, um, sodium can be can be considered as one of the uremic, uremic toxins as well. So we think uh, taking all these 
factors together, they can all interfere with uh, the correct folding of muscle proteins. Okay, are you planning any studies? Or did you do studies, in vitro studies, looking at protein folding in the presence of uremic uh, media? Um, I'm not pretty sure if it's done in Dow's field yet, but um, there's a lot of research about um, protein folding uh, with muscle chaperones in neuroscience field. So um, the paper I extracted in the slides is just published in like two two years or 1.5 years ago. Uh, I think the, the muscle physiology world has just recognized how important uh, chaperones are. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I don't think people really pay attention to this okay. question yet. Yeah, but, but still very interesting. Um, Cam, any questions about the chaperones, Cam? No? It's a, uh, well, it, it kind of goes very nicely hand uh, in hand with the um, data showing that uh, protein synthesis is uh, lower and inhibited in dialysis patients and proteolysis is increased. Our data shows that both of them are increased. But um, uh, our data, uh, our another piece of data also shows that dialysis patients' muscle protein synthesis rates is already reach its peak. Okay. So that's why um, we did not see, we, we, we think, we think that may explain the reason why they have um, anabolic resistance to protein feeding or certain like resistant exercise. Um, I think there's no prob very significant improvement with these um, interventions yet. And I think the whole point of my presentation is to um, to advocate that we have to correct the patient's um, physiological condition to uh, to correct them from a from a lot of physiological stress to a normal or considerate normal status. Um, but if we're not doing that giving patients more proteins or just prescribing resistant exercise or intradialic exercise is not enough to help them to improve their muscle outcomes. Yeah, that's what uh, we also learned from Dr. Weiland's uh, presentation. Um, well, there's one more question on calcification of the eye. So, and I think that's an important issue. You, you reported on PD and hemodialysis patients, and here the question is how frequent are ocular calcifications in the general population? or in the aging population? So we, we want to explore between hemo and, and peritoneal dialysis just because uh, in, in our country the, the calcium concentration in, in peritoneal dialysis bags is 3.5 as a standard. This is like a policy of the health department there in Mexico and it's 3.5 the, the concentration. So uh, we, we try to explore uh, if there is something that can uh, explain why those patients are with a higher number of calcification as well as uh, the presence of calcification. And when that is one of our hypotheses that it's a peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, there's one more question. How many patients had retinal detachment and is the rate of retinal detachment in dialysis patients increased? Uh, uh, actually, how many patients with retinal uh, um, detachment we have? That's, that's the question? Yes. Uh, actually, we have six patients with retinal detachment, and we have two patients with uh, blood in the vitreous area. And most of the patients were on the hemo, no, not on the okay. PD uh, group. Okay, but I think it would be nice to get more information on, on kind of control groups. Cam? Yeah, I was wondering, since we have two minutes left, uh, and since again we have Martin coming all the way from Germany, uh, and I showed a, a video from Germany where food and meals are being served. Yes. That was from three or four years ago when I was there in, in an area called Würzburg. So, in Berlin, where you practice? Well, in Berlin, yes, of so course. So, what, what are, do you guys offer meals, or is, has it become optional nowadays? So, what's the newest development in Germany? Well, the, 
actually we are offering meals, you know, and I, I worked in several areas in Germany. When I came to Berlin and uh, saw the dialysis unit, they were serving meals, and to my surprise, they were very much focusing on fresh fruit, okay, during dialysis, very nicely prepared, as you just showed with these strawberries. And uh, so Im initially I thought, you know, is that okay with the potassium? But you know, I've been there for 13, 14 years now. They are still doing that and the patients really um, value this. Okay, so, and you know, there's actually, I don't see any negative consequences on that. They get um, fruit, they get uh, bread, and they get, they get a nice meal and that's paid, that's included in the uh, revenue for dialysis. Okay. So they don't pay for that. And it's, uh, I think it's been standard in Germany and in other countries too. Um, maybe in the, and CAM is working to support this uh, in, in the United States, right? So, but here I think it's an economic problem also, as I understand. Um, maybe last question. Um, Come. would you recommend pre-albumin as a nutrition marker? Uh, the answer is pre-albumin would be great, but, uh, uh, and it's, uh, there are data suggesting pre-albumin. Pre it's not pre-dialysis albumin, it's called pre-albumin, as you, you know, or transthyretin, according to some other literature. It's, it's very accurate in terms of uh, outcome predictability. However, if you have serum albumin, that should be good enough. Okay, so with this, I thank you all for the nice discussion and uh, the very nice presentations. Congratulate all the abstract presenters again. And uh, well, with this, we conclude the session. Peter, you want to come up? Sure. Thank you, Martin, for, um, for the, uh, chairing this session. So thank you again. Congratulations to the winners. And I, I see we have thinned out a little bit, but nevertheless, it was really great having all of you here. And I hope to see you again in Las Vegas in 2021. So really, thank you and safe travels back home and have a good day.